So hello everybody, thank you for coming back. If you are uh, returning to us here at London Vegans, we are on the case for plant-based and cruelty-free. Uh, we had Steph on yesterday from Ethica Magazine. Today I am delighted to welcome a very special guest who is hugely popular in the dance industry. Uh, she's worked with the likes of Todd Terry, Armin van Helden, Axwell. Uh, in fact, the career is so huge. I, we haven't got enough time to talk about everything, but I really want to do a part two if Tara McDonald will allow us. How are you, Tara? I'm really good. Loving lockdown. <laughs> yes, we were just talking about that before because I, I guess it's given you a bit more time to be creative, isn't it? All this extra time. Yeah, kind of. Although I'm, I'm kind of obsessed now with cooking. That's what I'm doing mostly. And then I'm working in me, uh, for music like at night. So I, I tend to work through the night and then do regular things in the day and get up at midday. <laughs> well, that's all right. Yeah, because you're a bit like me in some respects. But since I met my partner, we've been going to bed at 11 in the, in the evening. I never used to do that. I always used to stay awake till two or three, but not yeah. anymore. I, st I, I was in that routine for the first uh, kind of the first month and um, was getting up super early, like six, going bed, going back to bed at like, I don't know, 11. And then now, um, now I'm kind of accustomed to what's going on. I was sort of really fearful in the beginning. You know, it's quite an anxious time, isn't it? But yeah. putting that face on. And um, yes, yeah, so I was going to bed like super early, still thinking we'd wake up from this terrible global dream that we're all having, or global nightmare. And uh, and now I'm kind of in the rhythm of it. And so I think like the brain is open to create and. So I'm doing that in the wee hours at night. <laughs> I love it. It's such a surreal time, isn't it? it it's like um, sleeping patterns are all over the place and you wake up at two, three in the morning and like you say, you kind of have to pinch yourself sometimes. It's like, what what, what the hell is going on? It's it's just weird. We've not really known anything like this before. Never. And actually, I'm, um, I, I messaged you this in Facebook, but I'm doing a charity record and, and um, of I Need a Miracle that I released like three years ago. Uh, and we are now in partnership with UNICEF. I'm a, um, an official supporter of UNICEF. And when I was speaking to them on Skype yesterday, this really puts the whole pandemic in, in a, um, I don't know, just shows the scale of what's going on, yeah. is saying in their 74 years of, of UNICEF, this is the worst ever crisis, more than the Second World War. And yeah, that, it's hideous, that, isn't it? I mean, yeah, so... Um, so I'm really proud to sort of do something. I wanted to do something to sort of help. So I'm going to do a, a GoFundMe page because my cousin is in the NHS and she's a frontline doctor. So uh, she didn't have any PPE. She had to buy it from um, Germany and get sent over. So that's why I wanted to, in the beginning to do I Need a Miracle again and donate everything to charity. Um, and now we're also in partnership with UNICEF because of globally this is just going to go on for for a long, long time until we have the vaccines, you know. Yeah, that's just it, isn't it? Because I think there are going to be repercussions if we're not careful also. You know, we've got to stay at home. We've got to, you know, protect others as well. It's it, Otherwise, it's just going to be an, a never-ending thing, isn't it? And I'm, I'm, I'm loving being at home. It's the longest I've been at home in like 15 years. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So the last time I, I saw you, well, we were talking about this just before we went live, was Manchester Pride. Manchester Pride was epic. Yeah, it was, because I was working for Gaydar Radio and you came into the studios in Twickenham and that was the first time I met you and then, of course, I saw you at Manchester Pride, but that was the last time I saw you. Was that 10 years? I think it probably was. I think it was, two, oh, do you know what? I know exactly what year it was. It was 2012. Wow. Okay. <laughs> time flies. <laughs> Like, I'm like I know that yeah because I know it was I just signed um to Universal to Mercury I'm not with them now I'm now with Warner and uh and I was promoting my first ever solo record so I remember that year there was a lot of changes and I was so psyched to do Manchester Pride because it was the first time <laughs> and last that I performed. it was brilliant I have such fond memories of it it was such a fantastic weekend a great crowd uh yeah Loved it. Brilliant. To me. Yes. Um, I've got so many questions for you, not just the ones that people have sent us at London Vegans, but also um, some live ones. I'm just trying to get the, the pop-up window. For some reason, it's not showing the live comments. It's disappeared. You know what technology is like? <laughs> My brain as well can't, can't cope with it sometimes. I'm just trying to find it. <laughs> Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> so let's... Like Oh, go on, let, let, let's talk about your, your work, maybe, for, for those that don't 
don't know you as, as a performer because you've been doing this job for quite a while now and you've worked with so many incredible people, not just your solo career, but also the producers that you've worked with. Like I say, you've worked with Armand van Helden, Todd Terry. I mean, these giants in the dance industry, you know, these, these producers and DJs, they're, they're just huge. What's the experience been like overall? Do you, do you ever look back and kind of think, wow, I just don't remember much about it or do you remember all of it? Is it quite a vivid memory? I've got some blank years. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, whole years where I don't really remember much. But I think that was the knock-on effect of constantly being on tour and not really sleeping. Like once I played the same club in Romania, apparently three times, and and I I, I was like that fish in uh, Finding Nemo. <laughs> door. Like I arrived at the club and I was like, hi, because I'm always super friendly. And they were all cuddling me and I thought, well, this is great. I didn't realize I'd already met them like three times before. And I said, this club is lovely. And I'm like, Tara, don't you remember that you, you've already performed here a few times? <laughs> couldn't remember it at all but yeah it's, it's been a, a bit of a whirlwind um I probably like the stuff I did with David Guetta changed life for me more than um with Todd Terry or Axwell or Armand just because he put me in the video like I begged to be in that video and and that that was the first time like if I went to a festival or a club that I was recognized before I had to work like so hard on stage before people went, oh, that's the singer from that song. So suddenly when the face was sort of involved, then some people were like, excited to meet me just for walking in the, the club, which that was the first time that happened to me and the first like times I'd got recognised. So that was really kind of exciting at the time. This is the thing, isn't it? Because a lot of dance artists, they don't get their recognition where they are visual because they have, they have the name on the credits and on on the track, but it's not always something that people know, you know, they don't know their face, the, the artist's face. So it's quite important, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, it was just like, um, I just really wanted to be in a video. I was like, God, I wrote this song. <laughs> Please put me in a video. <laughs> and I wrote to David... I, um, through Facebook or something and then at, at Christmas time he said oh this is my present to you Tara you're going to be in the video but all the other singers I've worked with in the past are now going to hate me because I never put any of them in the video <laughs> <laughs> started a little like get a war but um, yeah he was amazing I mean everyone that I've worked with has been incredible that's the thing because it's like choosing your favourite baby isn't it if you've worked with so many amazing people you can't say a favourite yeah, you, mu you must get asked that all the time who's the favourite producer you've worked with love Todd Terry. Yeah. He's so cute. He's like a big teddy bear. He'd probably hate me saying that. But <laughs> <laughs> we worked together. He came over um, a few years ago and we made a record that I thought was amazing and his label thought was horrible, so I didn't want to release it. <laughs> but I just love hanging out with him. He's so fun. He makes me cry with laughter. He thinks I'm mental and um, we gel really well. And I, I've got lovely memories working with him because he was someone that... I loved growing up, you know, like I would see him on top of the pops and be like, wow, I want to, you know, and then it's funny that I ended up going into uh, dance music because I, I never thought of, that I would do that when I was younger. Because you've got yeah. to have that chemistry, haven't you? I think it's really important when you're in the studio, especially, or if you're, you know, going on tour with somebody, you've got to have that connection. Well, especially like when I was growing up, I was so um, involved in nightlife. Like I used to be a go-go dancer. I used to go to heaven religiously, like Fruit Machine every Wednesday. I Amazing. would be there and uh, dressed up I used to do like we used to make our own outfits me and my sister and we'd to look less weird traveling up from Kent on the train we'd wear these big Japanese kimonos to hide <laughs> <laughs> and I shaved my head when I was younger so I used to like sew wigs in my um the little bit of hair that I had and I would sew a wig on on the train like going up to, to London. I was really mental as a teenager. I love it because you were born in, in Dartford and I was born just down the road in Swanley. Well, just outside Swanley. I don't think I've ever told you that. I didn't know you're a Kent boy. I'm a Kent boy. I lived there for 12 years in a place called Crocon Hill, a tiny little village outside Swanley, about a mile away from Swanley. You know, I think maybe we even played uh, district sports against each other. I was like, <laughs> I don't know when I was <laughs> Can you imagine? Such a small world, isn't it? <laughs> Do you know Jodie Harsh as well? She's from um, Canterbury. Oh, wow. I never knew that. Kentish maid. <laughs> yeah, and I used to work with Jodie Harsh. Well, uh, Jodie Harsh used to do one show at a place called Gem, which I worked at after Gator. I remember Gem, yeah. Yeah, and that was very, very brief. But um, yeah, such great memories. And you, of course, worked for The Voice because you were assistant uh, vocal coach on The Voice in Belgium. 
in Belgium. Yeah, that was kind of wild. Um, I <laughs> I was kind of terrified about being on uh, on The Voice because I'm not really like a trained singer. I've I've I mean I've had I went to theatre school and stuff like that, but everything I've done has sort of been very independent, you know, um, and just following my own road and and doing working on the voice really um made me realize all these years of experience because i've been singing since i was nine like i started off in musical theater i made my first record when i was 12 you know which was actually with unicef um and i had done all these crazy things like i ended up um, backing singing for rock stars like i did an album with brian ferry i worked with eric clapton like all these things and i kind of forgotten about that because you learn on the job and and you learn you do take in a lot of information so i was actually able to help people more than i thought i was but i i'd never been kind of like in a, a teacher role before so that was my anxiety was like if, I've, if i'm going to take on this responsibility um am i really going to be able to help these like young artists and and it was a really um really wonderful experience but i definitely went into it with like a lot of anxiety <laughs> especially because it was in french as well you know that's the thing isn't it it's like another challenge did you did you find that afterwards you 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 found that you were glad you did it and it was something that you overcame and you you you, you kind of gained something back as well you learned something yourself i definitely did i mean i realized i'm quite camera shy which is weird because being on stage is such a different thing. And I think that's that's another reason why I gravitated towards nightlife because you go into a club, you're kind of anonymous, really. You can live out a fantasy and wear whatever and, you know, you're living in your own dream world, you know. So um, I think that's why, because I, I am naturally quite shy. Um, and um, the voice, it was a really steep learning curve for me with sort of, that that side of being on television and look to what camera and 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 then directing people in French was was very difficult. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I suppose in hindsight as well, there are so many other challenges that you've you've had since. And I think if I did it again, um, I would do some things differently. And I'm, I've maintained a relationship with with some of the. The people that were on the voice and i try and give them advice you know when they message me for stuff and because music industry is you know it's really tough isn't it yeah <laughs> even more so, so now maybe yeah i think so it, it, well it, it's a balance isn't it like everything's shifted um it's uh, spotify and stuff like that like a lot of my friends i did a, um, a group um zoom chat the other day with the ivers with um female um, musicians in music talking about um, Spotify and things like that and if you're just a songwriter now it's really difficult to make a living so difficult because of the streaming sales that like one of my friends she's Grammy she won a Grammy for a songwriting she's written with Enrique Iglesias and all these massive names and it, um, even like high profile songwriters they're barely earning minimum wage if you spend just all your life songwriting which is really scary yeah, because you're putting a lot of a lot of effort into it. You're you you you're working so so hard, and if you've been doing it for a, a lot a lot a lot of years too, it's like a sudden change, isn't it? You've just got to adapt to those new changes. And I suppose it really started what ten years ago when when the downloads, especially with the chart anyway, when the the chart was reflecting downloads rather than sales. I mean, sales as in physical copies. Yeah, it's it's. I mean, the good thing about it is it's maybe easier to um, like homegrown artists to try and get some visibility because when I started, my first break actually um, was, did you ever go to the Cashmere Club or the Bedford in Ballam? It's um, a singer songwriters night. I've been to the Bedford. I've DJed at the Bedford actually. Yeah, yeah it's a lovely, lovely venue yeah. like in the club and stuff. So I um, sent in some demos. I was doing like a gospel acoustic project before, this is before I went into dance music and um, uh, I got spotted by someone at Universal Publishing that thought some of my songs were kind of okay and I went in for a meeting with them and actually I'd already written a couple of dance tracks that had been released but just in Russia uh, <laughs> so no one knows anything about them <laughs> and um, yeah they gave me the actual track to write to and, and then that's how that kind of happened and uh, oh and the year before that I'd worked with Planet Funk um, singing with them in Ibiza 
through someone I met at a parada party in Milan like a couple of years before that I was backing dancing. Um, I'm, I'm saying this in such a confusing way, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I love the story. It's amazing. I was a dancer for uh, many years, like in um, clubs, nightclubs, and then backing dancing for pop acts. I was backing singing for pop acts. I was trying to, any way to get into the industry, I was trying, you know, who can I back and sing for? How can I have an income and meet more contacts? Uh, so I was kind of trying to hustle, really, and then managing in... Um, in one vocal session, someone wanted to sing a demo of their song. So I wrote the middle eight section because they didn't have it. And then a boy band cut the song and that was my first uh, release writing for another artist. And, and and it charted like really well. It was like top five or something here. So, um, so then I was like, oh, I can write as well. I didn't know I could do that. And so, you know, then when, um, when Universal was interested in my writing and they gave me the Axwell track, we got in there at the right time because everyone had already pitched for it and ours came in really late um, and they liked the song. That's, can you hear my dog? I think it might be the postman. I love it. I've got a picture to show of your dog because there's a gorgeous photograph on your Facebook. We'll come, we'll come to that in a second because I've got a question about him. But yeah, he's, he's vocal just like Teddy, our rescue dog. Oh, I've got, she's Annie, it's a little girl. She's the love of my life. Oh, she's gorgeous. We've got to talk about your veganism because... Um, I'm just going to bring up a picture here because there's an amazing picture of you uh, wearing a t-shirt, animals are not ingredients. Oh, I 100% believe that. And I mean, you've, you've been a vegan for few, a few years. Is it four or five years? Yeah, I think it's probably like four, four years. I wish it was longer. Like everyone that becomes vegan, they're like, why didn't I do this earlier? It's really not difficult. <laughs> Everybody says that, don't they? I mean, I always say I wish I'd done it sooner. It's the only regret about going vegan because I've been vegetarian since I was about, I don't know, seven. And I just, I, I went vegan in the 90s and just wish I'd kept at it. But I, I guess it's easier now, isn't it? Super easy, especially being in the UK. Um, I, I mean, every... Actually, because you know I volunteer for Happy Cow as well. I, I've told you. I was going to ask you because you know the founder, don't you, of Happy Cow? Is it Eric? Eric Brent? Eric, he's lovely. I just met him from because um, I kept messaging them, going because when I became vegan, I was like, "What can I do that's like will fit in with my life really easily?" And it's such a it's so simple doing stuff for, um, for Happy Cow. You just have to eat at places and review them and that's just keep an eye on your local towns and then message, you know, your local vegan Facebook members. Oh, there's this new place. They've got these great cakes. <laughs> it's the perfect job, isn't it, in many ways? <laughs> I just have to go and eat. I mean, now it's a bit more difficult in lockdown. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but I'm really enjoying doing it. And then I've developed this relationship with Eric. He's been vegan for, I don't know, 40, 30 years and he used to live in India and that's where he got this idea of Happy Cow and he's very funny, he lives in LA, he's very sort of spiritual and stuff and um, yeah, it's, being vegan has been such um, a beautiful journey in my life. I feel like it's in line with my core morals, with who I am um, it's difficult to understand now people that don't want, don't think the same, do you know what I mean? Cause yeah. It really feels good. To, to be vegan it really does I know what you mean because I just wish more people would know how good it is and, and it's such an enlightening journey as well because you learn so much from from being vegan I think it's it's a bit of an eye-opener and especially um what's going on around the planet because as soon as you kind of are interested in veganism then it's also environmental issues uh, deforestation what's in your food you know health as well like health is such a, a massive um well, when you follow a good vegan diet, your health is just suddenly like, you know, it just goes through the roof, doesn't it? Your vitamins and minerals, you eat more varied things than than you would otherwise. And absolutely. In the kitchen. Yeah, well. absolutely. You think of your plate as well. And if you have a really healthy, balanced meal, it, it has so many colours. It's just so pretty to look at. Yeah. And I love, I don't miss anything. That's the thing. I really don't. No, I don't. This was difficult in the beginning to find like makeup brands that I liked that was ethical hair dye. As soon as I found one company that does a really good black hair dye, they seem to then, I don't know, <laughs> they don't exist anymore. <laughs> I'm like, oh God, now I've got to find another one. <laughs> I've noticed that and Polly's spoken about this before because obviously her having red hair, um, it, yeah. it, it, 
quite red. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. You seem to get, um, like you say, the product available for a short while and then it's discontinued and it's really frustrating, especially if it's something really good that really works. Playing in Superdrug. Why? <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us why you went vegan was it because of the animals because you I know you watched a few documentaries like what the health and cowspiracy what the health had a massive massive impact we I was like toying around with this idea of being, of being vegan for quite a long time I was really scared about doing it because I just thought it would be so difficult and um, which you know is completely wrong um and then I had my dog Annie suddenly having that relationship with an animal which I hadn't had since I was a child. Like as a child, I had like guinea pigs and I had cats and ducks and all sorts. Because I live, you know, deep in the countryside. Love it. And um, I just I hadn't really had that adult perspective of a relationship with an animal, being like a parent, kind of nurturing this other life and seeing all of her emotions, how scared she is, like with fireworks and random noises, she's shaking. You know? <laughs> and, yeah when you're a guardian of an animal then uh, that made me connect to other species uh then i had i was really fortunate to have this new year's eve where i was performing in sri lanka and we went to this um buddhist temple and the monk showed us around and one of the first things he said to us was do you eat meat and i was vegetarian i said no and he was like good you're not a murderer uh, which was like this is like a holy man saying that I was like, oh, it was, it shocked me, you know, and, and then I watched, um, Cowspiracy, Forks Over Knives, and What the Hell, and, and my partner's got a heart condition, and, and my dad was recently diagnosed type 2 diabetes, and, um, I watched What the Hell, and I was like, what the fuck are we doing? Like, really, what am I doing? And just the next day, it was like, right, I'm vegan now. So it was instant because it, it, it was instant for me. I mean, like I said, I've tried it before, but I didn't stick at it. And uh, it was overnight pretty much. And I just wish that I'd woken up before. It was like a light just went off, but it should have been sooner. It, it, it really, I mean, the what the hell, I wish I'd done it and said, yeah, 100% for the animals. Um, it was like, I, it just puts so much into perspective. And I do think it's like that karma. Do you know what I mean? Like a vegan diet is a good karma diet. Like it doesn't lead to cancer. It doesn't lead to diabetes and all these other like major diseases. You're way less likely to have health issues. So it, it's that really is that good karma, like cycle of love, really. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So what is your favorite meal? Do you, and we've just brought up a picture of your gorgeous dog. I love that picture so much because you're wearing like a onesie. Actually looks really snug. <laughs> I've got a whole collection of ones. <laughs> I love it. Do you have um, a, a favourite meal that you go back to? Because mine is a uh, Buddha bowl where I have like a selection of vegetables and like rice or potato or pasta and the tahini dressing over the top. And it's something that I tend to have all the time. Um, pesto. <laughs> nice. Love the basil. Love the basil. It was my boyfriend's birthday yesterday and I was like, oh, you know, what do you want for lunch? And he was like, I managed to get some basil. <laughs> Uh, I guess you're having pesto today for your birthday lunch. And then, um, yeah, I have that like every once a week probably and I make it fresh. So there's always half left over. So then I use it in a risotto and make a creamy risotto with the pesto. That's really nice. Um, and I also made two days ago, I forgot, like Fred's my boyfriend, I forgot it was his birthday because of lockdown. Oops. And I just happened to make sweet potato brownies, right? And he came in the kitchen and he was like, oh, is this my birthday cake? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. What day is it? What day is it? What? You know, I've lost all track of time. And luckily I hadn't missed his birthday. <laughs> I thought I'd missed it. But uh, yeah, so he had sweet potato brownies yesterday excellent you perfect were... timing you're not going to forget in the future are you <laughs> i've done it before <laughs> get those brownies ready in a year's time <laughs> once i had a gig in dubai and um he was coming with me as a tour manager he's actually the best tour manager i've ever had i'd say because he's really thorough and i got to the passport control and i gave our passports over <laughs> and she went oh it's your birthday so I'm like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> ordering in some shoes <laughs> <laughs> i love it it's awful so along with the food i know that you are a, a campaigner and i saw a picture of you doing the cuba truth ah, which is such an amazing experience i did it in leicester square i 
forgot I, I, I did that. Yeah, it's um, I, I, that was sort of, I guess, like not long after I'd become vegan and I was really nervous to talk to people because you really want to be super well informed and I was still sort of learning facts and figures and stuff. Um, but the other people that were in the Cube of Truth, a lot of them, it was their first time too. So they were like, well, you're a performer, aren't you? <laughs> Go out there. So I was um, the one sort of talking to the public a lot, which I didn't expect to do. No pressure. Yeah, it was an incredible experience and people were quite open to it. And because I had rewatched What the Health as well, certain people, um, because that, that what, that's what um, made me go vegan overnight, that that documentary and I think when people understand the fact that this doesn't do you any good I mean it doesn't do the animal any good but of course but it doesn't do you any good by consuming these products so um it made that really made people think about things in in a different way as well so yeah it was a good day excellent yeah I think what I got back from it was I was quite surprised by people's reactions especially people that didn't really think about veganism that much they it's almost like they they had everything explained to them in a really easy way it's like they could comprehend it because some people tend to have that you know they just want to brush it under the carpet they don't want to think about it too much but some people are are surprisingly quite you know quite tolerant of you explaining it to them and some people aren't but uh, yeah I was quite ex quite surprised by that what footage did you show I didn't show any footage the other guys that were holding computers they did but I was just there with you know with the 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 footage because there's different ones isn't there for different I, th I think it was slaughterhouse footage um and it's such it, it's such a massive impact when people walk past and they see it they're so stunned um to be confronted with those images which obviously are horrific and then it then you have someone friendly going over and explaining what's happening you know um I, it really does touch people like the cube of truth if, if anyone that's watching this and hasn't participated in the cube trip should definitely get involved because there's loads aren't there on facebook they're, yeah. they're in every more or less every town um around the country and and globally <laughs> globally there's, there's loads of uh, different branches so um i found it like really rewarding experience um and we were showing the the uh, baby chicks going in being like macerated and that was something i never knew about before i was vegan like when i stumbled across those videos i always watch bite size vegan because she explains things really easy i was like why shouldn't i eat honey you know and then oh bite size vegan she'll tell me why <laughs> yeah but that that's just it though isn't it because a lot of people think of the the food as it arrives in the supermarket they don't think about the process of it and people don't don't know how it gets there how it gets on your plate and i think if you do explain it to them in a in a, a civilized and gentle way i think people people are on your side ultimately Normally people are disgusted, like the baby chicks being macerated. When I, when I saw that on YouTube, I was crying for absolutely, like, you know, a few hours afterwards. Or And, and it, the, there's a weird thing, I think, when you, you click and you become vegan and then you're, um, you know, your, your world is in line with your moral core and you feel really good, you want to share it with people, and then... The, like walking into a supermarket and walking through like the butcher's aisle can suddenly be quite traumatizing is I don't know it's like the world just suddenly is very different overnight like one of my friends in Paris who's vegan and he he was crying <laughs> calling from a supermarket I just couldn't take it because <laughs> you know the backstory of how those animals got there you might have watched footage that morning and then then you witness um you know a whole broad display of legs of lamb and stuff like that and it is you know <laughs> I mean, it, everything in life um your perspective shifts so much it's it's hard to explain to somebody that that hasn't gone through the process absolutely yeah it, it can be quite triggering i think it you, you see the world in a different light don't you you see it differently yeah 100 percent. and the thing that's happening i think there's a ripple effect once someone in your family or someone you know becomes vegan and obviously that you suddenly uh, have like a lot of passion about what's on your plate and your lifestyle, it has like this ripple effect. So my mum and dad now um, are vegetarian. They, they call me up and they're like, you know, well, we're not having meat anymore. You know, we don't know if we're going to go vegan yet. My sister is now going vegetarian. Um, a lot of my friends, I started posting a lot on Facebook, especially in the beginning. Like, oh, don't do this to the animals. Don't do this. And some people probably unfriended me and then, 
five of my friends are now vegan as well. That's amazing. So your parents weren't vegetarian before? No. That's fantastic because I I think, and I've talked about this a lot on this channel, I think that everybody has their own pace and I don't think you should be uh, aggressive with people if they're not going fully vegan because I think sometimes I think people do eventually take it on and I I think that's more animals being saved in the process so I don't I don't think people should be given a hard time for that yeah they, they're, they're very stuck in their ways the, the thing that I do I'm quite crafty I um, invite a lot of my friends for dinner and um, especially because I live in Paris a lot so I'll say if I've got like a stylist or a hairdresser or, or my hairdresser's now vegan <laughs> amazing <laughs> like come to this restaurant with me like when Beyond Meat came out um, there's a restaurant in Paris called Hanks and they're now doing the Beyond Meat burgers so I took everyone in my team there and they're like oh we don't know the difference they might not want to become vegan or vegetarian but they're not scared of going into a vegan restaurant um, and they they might choose that now rather than uh, a meat burger and my one of the stylists I work with he he used to wear fur a lot and um and he doesn't care about animals at all you know and but he's lactose intolerant so now he's really enjoying vegan cheese and stuff like that and, and i'm hoping eventually the cruelty side of animals in fashion will will strike a chord with him so i'm going like gently yeah that's gently. definitely the way to do it and like you say if you do it not not as a secret but i think if you're cooking a meal for somebody and they they enjoy it uh, I think that's that's a plus. It's a win-win, isn't it? Because I, I think sometimes people, as soon as you tell them it's vegan, or as soon as they, you know, they they kind of switch off. They don't want to know. They're not interested. Same before, because I, I remember this the other day. My sister had a party, and one of her friends was like gluten-free, vegan. Like everyone had brought cakes, and they were all shop bought. And then one girl made some that was gluten-free, vegan. Da da da. And I, and this is before I was vegan, and I just thought. No, oh, <laughs> you made it. No, I'm going to go over here. Now I would gravitate towards the homemade, you know, unprocessed kind of cake. <laughs> Brilliant. So, now, yeah. Tara, we've got some amazing questions here that have been sent in. Are you ready? Yeah. Are you ready for this? <laughs> you messaged in. This is amazing. I love the excitement. So we'll start with, with Chris in Swindon, first of all, um, who is asking about your, well, he's, he's speaking about your passion for veganism and animal rights. Um, have you included that in your music as a, as a singer songwriter? Is it something that not just from like clothes that you wear, but also um, maybe singing about about veganism? Um, actually, Eric at Happy Cow also told me I've got to do a song, and um, I've I've written I've got two demos. One that's really cheeky is the only meat I eat is man. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <It's that deep>. <laughs> 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 and um, another one which is um, called Don't Be Cruel but they're, they're still like very much work in progress the Don't Be Cruel one is more uh, emotional and about the real thing but I think sometimes being vegan you know life can be um, a little bit depressing and I thought like the only meat I eat is man. We just give everybody a laugh. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I, I think it's like being my body. It's like when people get political in songs, sometimes in the past, like when you two have done it and maybe the Cranberries as well, it's when you're talking about war and stuff, it, it's it's quite a, a difficult subject to approach in music, isn't it? Yeah, and because the, the production team that I work with, then I'm the only vegan there, and they're like, no, you know, it has to be really emotional. And I said, do you know what? Every fucking day is emotional. Yeah. When I'm going in the supermarket, it's emotional. Yeah. When, <laughs> if so, if Because um, my partner's mum's French, she does not get it being vegan. She's actually shouted at me for half an hour saying, oh, my hair is going to fall out. I need to have... <laughs> And, you know, and I'm like, I am so hairy. Look, it's like, <laughs> it's like, keep, of- keep swishing the hair in her face. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I've still got it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got Lisa in York. Have you thought about writing? Oh, this is a similar thing, actually. Have you thought about writing a track about environmental issues and animal exploitation? I, I guess you've just answered that. Yeah, the Don't Be Cruel one, I really want to do. It's, it's hard to sort of get my label really excited about it um, <laughs> as much as I am because they know that um, I'm always trying to push things down the neck. Um, so even to do this, I Need a Miracle, and I'm like I'm giving all my uh, uh, royalties for however many years that they come in from, from this song will all go to the UNICEF um, charity. And I really, really want to do the, the vegan... Um, a, a good vegan anthem that we can all get down and boogie to 
and also something really heartfelt. And I'm, I've been struggling to sort of finish the demo, to be honest, because the, the lyrics really have to be on point. Yeah, something positive, something life-affirming. Yeah, I love the idea of Don't Be Cruel. And I was thinking about a music video where the animals are singing it, like really cute little animals. And there's a vegan artist I've approached, Linda Bell, to, to see if she'd want to do some artwork. And she was interested to do it. I saw her art at um, uh, Veg Fest. And it was just, like, she just does these beautiful um, drawings, illustrations of, of like, um, like say in the rainforest and there's all these animals around and the colors are really bright and, and happy. And it looks like a, sort of something that could be in a children's storybook, but it's so well done. And, and so she's into it. So I've, I've got to I love up. that. And I love that you're including vegan artists in the process too. That's great. Yeah, I would love to, um, to do more. You know, and because and I am still sort of a developing artist, like the label was saying you're an artist in development because I'm still trying to push forward and um, uh, gain more success, I guess, and recognition as a solo artist. And the more reach that I can have is obviously going to do more for the causes that I support. Excellent. Excellent. Big thumbs up for that. Uh, Sarah in London, as someone who travels as part of their job, which countries do you think are more advanced when it comes to veganism and what is on offer in shops and restaurants? Oh, good. I mean, I've, even Eastern Europe is like Prague, for example, it's got loads of vegan restaurants and they're really into the raw movement as well, which um, I'm not, I don't really eat that much raw food. <laughs> but, but I was so surprised of thinking Eastern Europe and there wasn't going to be very much available. Even when I was in like, Belarus, I was in Minsk and I found a really nice like vegan place. That's through Happy Cow as well, because I always check where where is local. Uh, I haven't had a country where I've really had a problem. Like I was in Tunisia and um, there's a lot of things that they can make which they don't necessarily realize is vegan, um, like the couscous and um, even the brick. They do this like paste, um, like a phyllo pastry thing full of vegetables. Oh, wow. And, Explain to them like no butter, no eggs, da, da, da. and they're looking at you like, why? <laughs> so I don't think culturally um, in Tunisia uh, veganism has hit hard yet. <laughs> Give them time; they'll come around to it. Um, <laughs> countries has been fantastic. Oh, Geneva! This was really weird. When I was in Switzerland, I was surprised I couldn't find a vegan restaurant. Wow! And that that was weird. I don't know, maybe there is an ambassador or something of Happy Cow in, in Switzerland, but I found it quite difficult when I was in Geneva to find a good restaurant. That's really bizarre. You would think that there would be at least one or there'd be some kind of movement, but I guess there must be because you can't have, you've got to have some vegans there, surely. Austria was amazing. When I was in Vienna, um, Swing Burger, because I do like my junk food. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> And there's a really good burger place called Swing, and I went there three times in three days. I love it. We'll, we'll put their link below if anyone's going to Austria. Good. And they do schnitzel, the schnitzel burger. So, yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> this is a really good question. I really love this. It's Ben in Oxford. Um, I think you should be an ambassador for Veganuary. Would you accept the offer if they asked you? Oh, yes, 100%. I would love to, yeah. Because there are so many great people representing Veganuary and the cause. I spoke to Carl Donnelly, the comedian, a few few months back, back at Christmas. And he's like so down to earth and so funny. And I, I just think it's such a great message. And, and it makes people aware that, you know, vegans aren't the typical cliche vegans that a lot of people think they are. Angry vegan or the, you know, yeah. Um, yeah, just, we're just regular Joes. Like everybody else. Yeah, absolutely. So, Veganuary, if you're watching, <laughs> Tara's here. Skin. <laughs> uh, Debbie in London, what did you have for dinner last night? I didn't eat dinner last night, which is very unusual. <laughs> I did make... Um, have you been watching Living on the Veg? Yes, I love it. On the Veg! <laughs> it's so brilliant, isn't it, to have that on a... Is it Sunday morning, Saturday morning? It's just prime to... Well, it's morning, isn't it? It's a good time yeah. to have it on. I mean, I've been watching it on iPlayer... Uh, ITV iPlayer and um, they've got this hearty stew have you made that one yet? No not yet was that has that just been on? Um, I think it was on a few weeks back but I just keep making it it's really good for the little odd bits that are left in the fridge and you can just shove all your veg in. Excellent yeah we love the Bosch boys. 
Yeah, it, honestly, it's so tasty. And Fred is, he's got like, even though he's vegan, he's got all these weird uh, fears. Like, he doesn't like fruit. He'll have it in a smoothie, but he's scared to look at it. I can't even eat an apple in the same room as him. It's like the smell. Oh, like, really? He's such a weirdo. Um, he's scared of soup. <laughs> <laughs> scared of soup. <laughs> Buying thing, and uh, yeah. So then I, um, when I made the stew, he didn't like the look of it because it was not soupy, but you know it's a stew. But then when he tasted it, then he's been begging me to make it again. So I just have to wear a blindfold. (laughs) (laughs) I got into like a cooking fog because I've never cooked so much in my life. (laughs) And I was just standing there. I think I'd zoned out and I was like, like a witch with a cauldron. <laughs> and uh, the casserole, I, I did too much veg and it was like full to the top. And when it came in, it was like, how are you feeding? Like an army? <laughs> this, this leads me to my next question. Emery London, would you write a vegan cookery book? Um, if so, what would you call it? That's a good question as well on its own because you need to have something snappy, a good title that people remember. Fun. I would want to do a fun, I mean, I'm new to the whole cooking world, like, <laughs> I've only been cooking since I was vegan, so I'm I'm gradually getting more a uh, confident cook, and I'm making a lot of, uh, you know, just following recipes, and occasionally adding in a tweak, where I feel like, oh, I'm a genius, I added paprika, <laughs> it worked, you know, so, but yeah, in the future, if I can make something really amazing, um, then yes, I, I, th- I think that's really good though because I think people relate to that because people there are a lot of people out there that aren't necessarily the best cooks and don't profess right. to be this kind of you know chef or anything. But I think yeah, yeah but I do things that taste nice. Yeah. Like, I'm always shocked because before I couldn't. That's the main <laughs> thing, isn't it? I used to say um, that's what restaurants are for. You know why? Why make it? We just go out and eat. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm finding a joy in doing it. Like even it is that act of nurturing, isn't it? Yeah. And self-love and love for whoever else you're cooking for definitely that, definitely these now i'm getting older <laughs> so the last question is from liam in stoke how do you deal with naysayers and people that criticize the vegan lifestyle do you get angry or are you calm and level-headed uh very much depends on where i am in my cycle probably <laughs> okay <laughs> i was gonna say i relate to that so obviously i don't but <laughs> i'm kind of similar and yeah it depends on how i'm feeling yeah, it depends what I've watched. Like, the, I did have an episode where it, um, I kind of let myself down, really. I wasn't calm and collected. It was with my partner's mum, yet again. <laughs> we have a relationship. Um, and it was about eggs, and she was saying, there's nothing cruel about eggs. It's natural. I buy organic, so they have an amazing life. And I'm an animal lover. And I was like, well, you can't be, because if you, you can't love them and eat them, and um, and then I showed her the footage of like the chicks because that's what I'd been watching all morning, <laughs> crying in a room. Yeah. <laughs> and um, and then she was like, "That doesn't happen in the organic farms." Uh, and I was like, "Well, it does." It yeah, does. people people just want to believe it doesn't happen, don't they? Almost. I see so much of it on my Facebook feed of people that will be showing off their steak or their burger, and then the next minute they'll be, "I can't believe he did this to a dog or a cow or a." It's like, well, it's, you know, there's a lot worse that happens, but you're obviously turning a blind eye to it. Yeah, she just, I think she'll, she's one of those people that um, I'm never probably going to change. And then I actually watched, I was a bit upset afterwards that I'd lost my call because I don't often get angry. So when I do, I, <laughs> I feel like terrible, you know. And then I watched a James Ash, Aspie video and he was saying about how to deal with things like that and it calmed me down and sort of, you know, then the next time I've had an issue, I've been a much more cool and collected and, and just try and put my point across and think, well, if I can't change somebody's mind, at least I didn't let myself down and I did it in like a more intelligent way rather than... There are so many campaigners that do that. I mean, there are a lot of campaigners that are very passionate and kind of very forthright, but some campaigners like Earthling Ed, as an example, he's so calm. I mean, I've yeah. seen him obviously get fired up occasionally, but I think you're bound to. But he's just so brilliant, he's so articulate. Yeah, and and I think that's that's what we need, really. And my like, I always say my sneaky ways. If I'm cooking something, and because I I actually had a bit of anxiety about going into a vegan restaurant. I I felt like um or going somewhere vegan. I felt like I would automatically be judged, especially when I was just sort of first doing it. Now, obviously, I've 
you know, I just rock up. Yeah, give me whatever. <laughs> and that burger. <laughs> I love it. We we have so much to ask you, but um, all the questions have been asked. So thank you for answering those, and thank you for everybody for sending them in. We could do a part two because there's so much to ask you. There's not enough time in the day, is there? Let's do it. Yeah. Oh, oh I have to show you my T-shirt. This is Sassy Spurred. It says, "Eat melons, not me." <laughs> I love it. Brilliant. And if you want to, you know, give us any links that we can drop down, uh, stuff that you've talked about in this video afterwards, I can put them in, in the description. And also your your social media stuff as well. Do you want to tell people where they can find you? Yes. <laughs> to look, look, get my mind together. Um, Tara McDonald TV, Instagram, um, and Tara McDonald TV for YouTube. But Facebook, it's Tara McDonald Official. And hopefully soon a Veganuary Ambassador, if you're watching Veganuary. <laughs> I don't know how maybe I have to message them we should do it. I would love to do it yeah do it do it that would be so cool to see you doing that Tara it's been so good to catch up with you again Thing to catch up with you hopefully we'll be able to do it in live soon I Whenever was just thinking that and then everybody can come and see you performing too because you must miss that oh so badly I, I, my first gig that was cancelled was a festival in Italy <laughs> I was like oh that's not going to happen and I was meant to um do Euro Pride in Greece this year and, and sing the anthem. Oh, what a shame. That actually killed me. That, like, well, I'm still here, so it didn't. But um, when I found out that that was cancelled, I was just like, because oh. I, I did Euro Pride in 2016 and it was the most amazing, amazing experience. And I was just really, really <laughs> so badly looking forward to it because I knew in January I was going to do it. And I had to keep it, you know, as a secret. And then no, it's been cancelled. Yeah, what a shame. Hopefully, we'll you, you'll get the the chance to do it again, maybe next year or the year after. I uh, hope so. Oh, fingers crossed. It's good to see you, Tara. Listen, take care, you and Fred. And you're. I'm going to do a live performance. Sorry, Phil. Yeah, go on, go. <laughs> Trying to go, Tara. go. Tell us. <laughs> There's um, my local animal sanctuary, um, the animal uh, retreat in Aylesford, Kent, and I'm going to do a live performance, um, like fundraising for them on, uh, and I'll put the link down because it's just been confirmed and thought I'd mention that. Brilliant. We'll, we'll stick all the info down after as well, and we'll see you soon. Lots of love. Uh, darling, lovely to see you. Thanks to everybody for watching as well. See you soon. Bye. Bye.